Good morning. Welcome to Oak Grove Baptist Church, live streaming from San Jose, California. We're glad you're here, either in person or watching from afar. It's a beautiful Lord's Day. It's warming up. The sky is clear. And we're going to have a wonderful time. And today we're doing a special event, potluck, after the morning service. So if you're here present with us, you're invited to stay. You never know what you get, but it's going to be good. So without any further ado, would you stand, please? Come thou fount of every blessing. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, calls for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, some by flaming tons above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I come, and I hope my good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor Daily I'm constrained to be Like thy goodness, like a fetter Blind my wandering heart to thee Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it Prone to leave the God I love Here's my heart Take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Pastor? Let's bow for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we bow before you this morning with our hearts and our minds focused upon you, we come here, Father, to worship you, to lift up your name, and to praise you because you alone are worthy of all of our praise. And Father, we just want to bow before you with humble hearts because of the grace and the love you have bestowed upon us. Help us, Father, to bask in that. Help us, Father, to, uh, as we worship you today, to feel your presence in a very strong and powerful way. And may you speak to us through your spirit and through your word today. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. A couple of words of announcement. So last week, I told you about the new way we were going to get stuff for the shoeboxes. The cards that were scattered on the back table, you take one and you, you shop for that and you bring it in. Well, I had a card that said six to ten toothbrushes. So I want you to know, there's my toothbrushes, and at the end of the service, I'll take these back there and, and uh, drop them in the box. There's already been deposits in the box, so there's still cards out there. There's cards that say socks, girls' socks and boys' socks, not to be confused with men's socks and ladies' socks, but, you know, smaller feet. So grab a card and do your shopping this week. Also, as I said earlier, we're going to potluck today. That's the third ordinance of Southern Baptists. Uh, the Lord's Supper 
baptism and potluck. So we're going to do that today. Over in the fireside room, plenty of food. I've already been over there sniffing. The last thing I want to tell you is that Saturday night, this coming Saturday, is the men's wild, wild game dinner. We're going to be able to sample various kinds of, of wild game. It's been modified slightly. We were planning on venison, lamb, bison, bear, alligator, and ostrich. Kind of expensive. No. The alligator ate the ostrich, <laughs> and the bear ran off. Well, then you just eat so the this, this week, the pastor has to go hunting for the venison. <laughs> but in any event, we're going to have a good time. We have alligator, we have bison, we have lamb, and we're planning on venison. And there'll be side dishes, and there'll be a message. So come Saturday evening, 5 o'clock. And we'll have a time of fellowship for the men and eat some wild game, whatever happens to show up on the doorstep. I was gonna I was gonna try for Himalayan possum. Tastes but like I couldn't find Himalayan in the street. So anyway, that's enough of that. We're gonna have a good time. Let's sing Victory in Jesus. <laughs> Savior forever be so 
Here I am to worship. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. So here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say. together worthy all together wonderful to me king of all days you are so highly exalted glorious in heaven above humbly you came to this earth you created all for love's sake became poor Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. And you'll never know how much it costs to see my upon that cross now you'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross now you'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross and you'll never know how much it costs to see my sin up on that cross now here i am to worship here i am to bow down here i am to say that you're my god you're all together lovely all together worthy all together wonderful to me light of the you step down into darkness, open my eyes, let me see. This next one we're going to sing as a special. You won't have the words, just sit back and listen to what it says. You're the only answer to the darkness. You're the only right among the wrong. You're the only hope among the chaos. You're the only voice that calls me on. Louder than any lie, my sword in every fight. The truth will chase away the night. Is power over the darkness, freedom for the captives, mercy for the broken and the hopeless. Your name is faithful in the battle, glory in the struggle, mighty. Certain. I know what the world will never fail. I know what in every situation. Oh, yes, I know you speak the power to prevail. Lighter than every lie, transformed in every fight, the truth 
will chase away the night. Your name is power for the darkness, freedom for the captive, mercy for the broken and the hopeless. Your name is faithful in the battle, glory in the struggle. Light arrives and heaven opens. Holy Spirit, let me hear it. When you speak, the church awakens. I believe the change is coming. Holy Spirit, let me hear it. When you speak, the shadow of darkness. Light arrives and heaven opens. Holy Spirit, let me hear it. Church awakens. I believe the change is coming. Holy Spirit, let us see it. Your name is power over darkness, freedom for the captives, mercy for the broken and the hopeless. Your name is faithful in the battle, glory in the struggle. Mighty won't let us down. Your name is power in the chaos. Your name is power. Woo! Ooh, that'll wake you up. Two thousand and nine, two thousand and nine, Greg Epstein, a humanist chaplain at Harvard, wrote a book called "Good 
without God. His book expired to bring out the positives of a humanist world view. Though he was raised in a Jewish family, this so-called chaplain is an atheist. And in the summer of 2021, the 44 year old Epstein was elevated to the president of Harvard's chaplain's organization. He is an unusual choice when you consider that Harvard was founded with the purpose to train ministers and that its namesake was a Puritan pastor by the name of John Harvard. One student piped up and said that Greg's leadership is not about theology. Yet Epstein was a unanimous choice for the job as lead chaplain at Harvard University. And upon taking the reins of leadership, Epstein declared, we don't look to God for answers. We are each other's answer. How are we to live in a world that's full of uh, imposters like that? The Apostle Paul gives us a word in the book of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 10. So I invite you to open your Bibles there with me or look on your devices as we look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 through 17. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings. What kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra? The persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus." All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. As we look at this passage today, the first thing I want us to see together is that uh, to how, uh, to, uh, as we want to... Um, Stand firm in the world that's full of quicksand and imposters calls you to follow the right example. The Apostle Paul was a seasoned veteran. He was a scarred soldier. He was imprisoned for his faith and death loomed ahead of him and the book of 2 Timothy is probably his swan song. So he's drawing out some valuable lessons for young Timothy from his life. In verse 10, it begins with a very strong word of contrast. But as for you, Timothy, in contrast to all of those who are, uh, who are lovers of themselves and lovers of money in the first few verses in chapter 3, to all of those who have Cho uh, chosen to oppose the truth to in contrast to all of those who have taken the path of least resistance and in contrast to the early empty show of religion in contrast to all of the declining morals all around you and in contrast to the rise of those false teachers like Janus and Jambres in the Old Testament who opposed Moses, you stand firm for you have followed and shared in my example. You followed in my teachings and what follows are nine adjectives. You have followed in my teachings, my manner of life. You have followed in my purpose. You have followed in the, my faith and patience and love and endurance, 
and suffering and persecutions that happened to me on that first missionary journey where he went to Antioch of Pisidia, Iconium, and Lystra. You recall how at Antioch they tried, they, they ran Paul out on a rail. They ran him out of town. And Iconium, they threatened to stone him. And there at Lystra, they did indeed stone Paul. And they left him outside the city gates for dead. Paul was not tooting his own horn here. He wanted Timothy to know that what he saw in Paul and how, what, how he lived out his life he was, it was not some type of theory that he was following, but that he was doing it because he was following in faith and following after Christ. What he saw was his faith at work and real life. The world wants you and me to follow after its example. The world wants you to think that Christianity is out of date or it's not relevant. But Timothy, you know the difference. You followed me. That word for followed after means that he walked side by side with Paul. That he followed in the same footsteps that he traced out his example of his life. Timothy, you shared in my life and you saw my example living out my faith in the midst of all of those difficulties. For many years, Monterey, California was a pelican paradise. In the 40s and the 50s, as the fishermen would clean their fish, they would fling the offal to the birds. And those pelicans grew fat and they grew lazy. But when the offal was utilized in another way, there was no longer a free lunch for those pelicans. And when the change came, those pelicans made no effort to fish for themselves. They just waited around and they grew gaunt and they grew thin. And many were even starving to death. They had forgotten how to fish for themselves. The problem was solved when they imported new pelicans, birds that were accustomed to foraging for themselves. And they were placed among the starving ones. And immediately the newcomers started fishing. And before long, the hungry pelicans followed suit. Paul wanted Timothy to remember how he followed after his example, and he did not want Timothy to grow spiritually uh, uh, thin. And so it, during perilous times, and so he re recalls to Timothy how he followed after him. Timothy not only heard Paul's teaching of the gospel of Christ, he saw his manner of life. He saw his conduct. He saw how he lived out his faith before him. He saw that Paul did not pull down with his living, his life, what he built up with his preaching. It is true that oftentimes the only sermon that someone is going to see is when they see one of us, a Christian, living out their faith before them. In addition, Timothy, you saw my aim. You saw my purpose for life. You shared in that same purpose as you followed after me. You knew my vision, and you shared in what motivated me to glorify God with my life and for the salvation of the souls of men. Our aim today, we know there's a potluck next door. Our aim is not a potluck. 
our aim is to glorify God with our lives. You also saw how I lived out my faith. I did not just speak about faith in an abstract theoretical way. You saw my utter dependence upon God, my utter trust in God. You also saw the patience that was produced in me by the Holy Spirit. The word means long suffering. It me speaks of not of having a long fuse towards somebody who wrongs you. He did not have a short fuse, but a long fuse. Now, in case you think that Paul must have been some perfect example, you got to remember this has been 14 years since after his calling on the Damascus Road that he goes out on this missionary journey, his first missionary journey. And through that time, God was shaping him and transforming him as he grew in his faith. Then you saw the love that the Holy Spirit produced in me, a sacrificial kind of love, the kind of love that seeks the welfare of others. You saw how I loved my enemies, Timothy, and how I prayed for them. You saw the endurance that I had that was in my life that I remained under a load because of my faith in Christ. Timothy, you are going to face difficult days that are ahead of you, and you'll need the same kind of qualities to be uh, in your life, and you'll need to be yielding to the Spirit so that these things will be uh, developed in you. And it calls us to wonder, what example are we following after today? Whose example do I follow in living out my faith? Am I following the right example? Am I following the example of, a, of a, a, a seasoned saint who has gone on before? Am I following the example of Christ in my life in order to stand firm in the world that is full of imposters and quicksand? We need to be following after the right example. Secondly, it calls us to dwell in the truth that we have learned. After this brief biographical sketch in verses 10 and 11, the Apostle Paul gives an exhortation to Timothy to continue in what he has learned about God in verse 14. If you have ever stood on a beach and let the surf wash over your feet, and as the water recedes, it washes out the sand under your feet, you know what the effects of an undertow are, is like. Those proud and boastful false teachers who were lovers of themselves had created an undertow which threatened to wash away Timothy's footing. The Apostle Paul did not want that to happen. He wanted Timothy to keep his life firmly planted on the rock Jesus Christ. And so in verse 13, he terms those false teachers as evil men and imposters, charlatans. And he, verse 14 begins with that same strong word of contrast that we saw in verse 10. But as for you, in contrast to those wicked men who drag others down to destruction, in contrast to those imposters who use trickery to deceive others, you stand out in bold relief on the truth that you have learned about God from the Holy Scriptures. You stand out in bold relief as God's servant against those evildoers and imposters who really are on course to go from bad to worse. How? That word continue in verse 14. In my translation, some of you have dwell. It means to dwell, 
to abide. It's the same word that spoke about Christ in John 1 when he came into this world and dwelt among us. It means to make your home in. It means to be at home in the truth that you have learned from the Holy Scriptures about God. To stay and continue to dwell in what you've learned about God from those Holy Scriptures. It's an imperative. It's not an invite. It's not a suggestion. It's not even if you're inclined to. It's a command. It's in the present tense to keep on dwelling in those, what you have learned from those holy scriptures. It's what the old Baptist preacher would say when he, said, when he, when he meant when he said, if you cut me, I'll bleed bibline. It's not so much that we are carrying a Bible around. It's how much the Bible gets into us that matters. It's not so much how hard we are holding on to God's word. It's how much God's word has a hold on us that matters. Timothy had not only learned, uh, he was convinced that what he learned about God was true. He had lived them out in the laboratory of life. He had seen it in the life of the apostle Paul. He had become personally assured of them that he had a deep con inner conviction concerning the reliability of the truth of God. In his early years, British statesman Joseph Chamberlain taught Sunday school, and his favorite Bible verse was Genesis 12, 5. They went forth into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they went. This verse was like the motto of his life of this iron-willed man's life. It gave him a biblical basis for citing two qualifications for success in life. One is to have the right destination. They went forth into the land of Canaan. And the second is to keep going after you get started. Into the land of Canaan they came. Timothy had started well. And he, the Apostle Paul wanted him to finish well by adhering and abiding and dwelling in the truth of God's word and then to keep on dwelling in God's word for the rest of his journey. You and I are not like a bunch of leaves being tossed around by the wind of our culture. Rather, we are to be arrows headed for a target. And we stay on target by abiding and dwelling in God's holy word. Another reason given in verse 14 for Timothy to continue to dwell in what he had learned is because he had known those who had taught him. He had learned the word of God we read in the 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, from his mother, Eunice, and his grandmother, Lois. He learned the Old Testament scriptures at their knees. They taught, and they taught him that Jesus Christ was the Messiah who fulfilled all of the Old Testament scriptures. And Timothy knew their lives. He knew that their faith was genuine. He was also mentored by the Apostle Paul, and he knew his faith was real. How we need to pass on our faith to others so that they can stand strong in the midst of a world full of imposters and quicksand. The third thing calls us to stand on the very word of God. In our pluralistic and permissive society, we are overwhelmed 
that it seems as if anything goes these days. Homosexual marriage, gender surgery for kids, men competing in women's sports, schools encouraging students to choose whatever, how, whatever they want to identify with. It is so odd and so strange to us, all of these views, that we are left to wonder, has the world absolutely gone mad? But instead of responding with our heads in the sand, or instead of throwing up our hands and, and surrender, we must continue by standing on the word of God. In verse 16, it says that we can, we can stand on the word of God with confidence, knowing that it is God breathed. It indicates that it did not come from any human perspective. Human writers were not breathed into by God, but it says that scripture itself was breathed out by God. He is the source of scripture. God himself brought it into existence. Verse 16 says, All scripture originated in God's mind and was communicated from God's mouth by God's breath. So what the Bible says is what God says. The Bible is the supreme court from which there is no other appeal can be made. God's word is where we take our stand. It was on that basis that Martin Luther took his historic stand on April 18, 1521. At the Diet of Worms, where he was called on the carpet by Johann von Eck, the official general of the Archbishop of Treres, to renounce his errors, Luther replied, Unless I am convinced by the testimony of Scripture or by evidence of reason, I believe neither in the Pope nor in councils, since it is established that they often have erred and contradicted themselves. Luther went on and said, I am a prisoner of Scripture, and my conscience has been taken captive by the very word of God. Here I stand, I can do no other, God help me. And that stand that he took on the word of God brought the church out of the doldrums of the dark ages into the enlightenment of the Reformation. And its effect is still being felt today. Scripture in verse 16, is profitable or beneficial uh, and useful. That is, when God's word is loved, when God's word is uh, learned, and when God's word is lived out in our lives, it is beneficial to us in many positive ways. And he elaborates in verse 16 on how it's useful First of all, he says it's, the, the passage says it's useful for teaching. Scripture is the church manual for communication, for uh, inf information about God. It instructs us about his kingdom and his, doc and his doctrine helps us from error and unfolds God's plan of salvation for humanity. It's also profitable for reproof or for rebuke. It rebukes us when we are in error. It exposes all that is false in our lives and in our darkened hearts. It throws the light on the darkness of our lives and it convicts us of our sin. It's like an umpire that cries out at a ball game, you're out of bounds or you're, it's foul. Scripture keeps us in line. And it's also useful for correction. That word means to make a start all over again. 
It's used, it's also was used to help someone get them back on their feet once they have stumbled. Scripture, when it's taken to heart, sets you and me up straight and puts ourselves on our feet so that we can indeed be going in the right direction. Finally, it's useful for training in righteousness. Teaching can be done in an hour in a classroom, but training takes years. Training involves rep, uh, re, repeating what you hear and studying the word. Perhaps you've heard of muscle memory. Muscle memory is, is when the brain creates a long-term memory for a certain task to be performed. Like, you know, riding a bike or how a tennis player will practice their swing and how a golfer will practice uh, their swing. You see it in typing. You see it in musicians as they play instruments. The way to stand firm in a world that is full of quicksand is to develop spiritual muscle memory of, of, of God's word in our lives so that when we encounter falsehood or imposters or charlatans, we can stand firm as we live out our lives. This morning, the way to stand firm in a world that's full of quicksand is to take your stand on the truth of God's word and to live that out. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are indeed so grateful for your word that instructs us and corrects us. We indeed thank you, Father, for the living word, Jesus Christ, who came and died for us. Father, may you move and work in our hearts and minds today, and we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor. As we come to the end of our service, we offer an invitation. We offer an invitation for you to respond to the Holy Spirit through the pastor's message, through reading the scriptures, whatever has prompted you to feel the need, see the need for Christ in your life. Feel the need to align yourself with this church. Whatever God has spoken to you about, this is the place. Now is the time to make it known. Come forward, tell the pastor what God has spoken to you about. As we sing, Jesus is calling. Would you stand, please? Jesus is tenderly calling you home, calling today, calling today. Why from the sunshine of love will you roam farther and farther away? Calling today, calling today, Jesus is calling, is tenderly calling today. Jesus is calling the weary to rest, calling today, calling today. Bring him your burden and you shall be blessed. He will not turn you away. Calling today. Calling today. Jesus is calling. is tenderly calling today. Jesus is waiting, oh, come to him now, waiting today, waiting today. 
Come with your sins at his feet, lowly bow. Come and no longer delay. Calling today. Calling today. Jesus is calling, is tenderly calling today. We're going to do things a little different. I'm not going to ask the blessing on the food that we're about to eat. I'm just going to pronounce the benediction. Then you all make your way over to the fireside room and find a seat. Then we will have the prayer and serve the food. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace today and forevermore. God bless you. Join us for potluck and we'll have the blessing shortly. You are dismissed.